Finally caught alive. There we go. <laughs> Uh, another pizza day. Absolutely. What time does it start in USA? Uh, well, we have... I'm out of focus. Hold on. Why am I out of focus? There we go. We have numerous time zones. And uh, we also have the wrong branding on here. There, we can fix that real quick. Anyways, let me get to where it focuses on me and not back focusing. Those are little details. It is currently 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so middle of the day here in EST. Um, the region area I am in is Detroit, Michigan. Um, but unless you live in Detroit, then you're going to correct me and say, Tom, you're in the suburbs of Detroit. So, you know, we mentioned that last time. There's the banter back and forth about whether you're in Detroit, the suburbs of Detroit, and it really depends on how far they are. So, nonetheless, um, good evening. So as uh, Simon's pointing out, it is 8 p.m. in the UK. So, yes. Backing up the VMs uh, to a storage cluster, exporting these backups to a Synology and testing backups tomorrow. Yeah, it's a lot. You know, going through your full disaster recovery testing process and plan and making sure you can restore your virtual machines is really important. Um, untested backups are wishful thinking. You know, just one of those things. You, you got to go through the plan once in a while. It is tedious, but that's actually what I was working on. And I can, let me see if this works today. Oh, look at that. Recursion. And uh, so we get some recursion going on, but we can show the video Tom was just talking about. Actually, let me remove comment. I'd comment. There we go. When you do everything yourself, you see the behind the scenes on all of this. <laughs> um, but this is the video I was working on. It's just talking about data, data backups, making them more resilient. Uh, this video is rendering right now. As a matter of fact, uh, if I slide down, yeah, it's still rendering. You can't see the other screen. Um, well, you can if I do this. If I do this and do this, video editing going on behind me. And uh, well, the video editing part's done. It's just doing the rendering part now. But if we switch over to here, and then we scroll up to this. So that's uh, the video I was working on, talking about backups and making sure you separate how your shares are versus your web interfaces for things like TrueNAS. I use TrueNAS as an example, but I also mentioned in the video that, yes, this applies to more than just TrueNAS. It's, um, it's a popular topic because, uh, you know, you always hear and people start with the words immutable backups. So I'm like, I'm not sure you're defining it properly because it's usually just hardening backups to have something set up as in write once, read many for your backups creates a problem of making sure you have a mechanism to handle all of the revisions of backups. Unless you have infinite storage, then ignore my comment there. Most people don't have infinite storage. So if you have a backup that can accept writes but does not want to delete, you have to have a delete mechanism so the old backups can get purged away. So this, uh, I, I just went through and kind of explained that. I explain it a lot to people a lot in emails, um, people opening tickets and wanting help configuring things. So when I have a video on a topic, sometimes I'll just reply, I have a video on this topic because what you want isn't exactly how it works. Here's my video to explain it. Let me know how you'd like to be, uh, proceed and go forward. So, ah, uh, lots of fun. Uh, let's see. Is there a reliable GPU in Caden Live? No. Uh-uh. Uh, -uh. uh I just, I moved to DaVinci Resolve. That's what's re rendering in the background right now. And I moved to DaVinci because Caden Live, I didn't want to deal with it no more. I didn't want to deal with any of the problems. I didn't want to deal with any of the rendering issues. And I'm really regretting not moving to DaVinci Resolve sooner. I think Caden Live's great. I still recommend it to people starting out. But once you need some of those advanced features, DaVinci really just is so much better than Caden Live. Boss wants to beatable backups on a shoot tape budget. We are keeping uh, one or two copies and after finish just shutting down the Synology. Yeah, I mean, and that's what I talk about is people just think you can just flip a switch. Isn't there an immutable button? That is a more common than you would think question that comes up uh, when people engage with us for services. Well, I just wanted you to check the, show me where the immutable box is. I'm like, there's not an immutable box to check. There's a process to create uh, resiliency and uh, make it difficult to get to your backups, but that's a process and there's steps. So that's um, definitely 
it's not, and that's not that it's difficult. It's just making sure people understand it. But then they realize that some of these steps I mentioned do make things a bit difficult. Like I, I talk about going as far in TrueNance as shutting down the web interface and locking it down. Sure you can. That makes it harder for someone to get inside your TrueNAS and delete your backups. That also makes it harder for you to get inside your TrueNAS to do administrative functions. So it really comes down to what's your risk tolerance and setting it appropriately. Putting management to TrueNAS on a separate interface, great idea. At least having separate passwords, huge idea. That's where if you spend time reading through reports of how they got into the backups, you'll frequently find common password usage all the time. Matter of fact, a huge amount of support with TrueNAS. Um, people, when they upgraded, hey, the upgrade broke my shares. What password and user were using for your shares? Uh, root. Really? You were using root and the password to get into your TrueNAS as your share password. TrueNAS disabled that and people thought that was a terrible thing that really aggravated them. And I'm like, why were you using root and not setting up another user? This is, this is where the problem is. <laughs> Uh, so that's, uh, yes. Uh, there are times rotating backup drives works, um, quite for, yeah, I mean, yeah, physically taking things out of service or out of a uh, connection like this right here is a solution to that. Will it focus? Man, it's, there we go. This little sand disk is uh, one of the places I, I keep some data. Um, I keep it encrypted at rest using Lux, but this is offline and then goes into a safe. And when it's in a safe, now it's protected from potential fire, um, makes it more challenging to steal. I never say impossible. I mean, spend spend a, a little while watching the lock picking lawyer and you'll realize there's really not too much. I mean, it's, it's once again a security mitigation, putting things behind locks traditional physical locks not a bad mitigation but boy the lock picking lawyer makes it all look so easy <laughs> I, I think there's probably um a lot of people here who also watch the lock picking lawyer if i had to guess the the audiences are a big crossover of them so grayson thank you for the donation i backed up all my data home server using ssh bzip tar file simply pipe tar to ssh and ssh for the cat backup tar z yeah that works in a simplicity standpoint how do you avoid bit rot? Use ZFS. That is the really good answer to that. Um, that's one of the big things is obviously when you keep a lot of backups or just a lot of data that you have sitting around is um, having it stored on a ZFS array will protect it from bit rot. This is built into the scrubbing functions of ZFS. We'll go through and make sure your data still uh, remains with full integrity. That is a problem bit rot with lots of, you know, things like this. I wouldn't just assume that I would never lose data that's on here and it will always be readable. That way, anything critical, if it's important to me, is on more than one of these. Because yes, I have a few of these um, and I make sure I've got multiple copies of it. That's the only way. I mean, it sounds, it, you know, it's funny, you've been doing this for years and it sounds eccentric. And then years later, people are like, that sounds practical. <laughs> I'm like, yes. Anyone who's experienced some data loss finds all these steps very practical. They just seemed inconvenienced at the beginning. At the beginning. Oh yes, another he, boy. Yeah, you you watched all the lock picking lawyer. There's really um, he's got this new series of kind of exploring and looking a little bit deep more detail, um, covering the different details of lock picking in terms of like he's got that uh, cutaway lock. Those have been fun to watch. My wife watches them with me too. She's like watching them get into locks. I'm so looking forward to whatever he releases tomorrow. If you have not watched the April 1st videos of Lockpicking Lawyer, they are my favorite. Lockpicking Lawyer knows how to do a video for April 1st. So I won't spoil anything. Just watch them. <laughs> not just ZFS. Make sure you scrub a regular basis. Uh, see what happened to Linus. Uh, well, yeah, he did not have ZFS scrub turned on. That's what happened to Linus. So... Um, TrueNAS doesn't re-silver unless you replace a drive. Uh, the scrub process is not the same as a, um, is not the same. Are there still scenarios not to use ZFS? Um, 
it's not real helpful with single drive. It's not bad. It, it, it's not terrible with single drive, but there's, um, I think the only exception might be if you have something low powered, like a raspberry Pi, um, that may not be the most optimal place to use ZFS, it, especially if you're using any of the ZFS with encryption or anything, there may be certain overheads ZFS has that may be less favorable. So maybe IOT devices and things like that, um, is less ideal and it's still i don't know but i've heard there's some performance uh that may not be 100 percent there under linux so uh it's really good under bsd i'm not 100 percent if the performance is at the same level under all all linux situations but it's still pretty good um so there's those little considerations so there's not a, a whole lot of reason not to do it any plan for video release tomorrow Yes, I am working on something else for tomorrow, uh, but probably not an April Fool's video. Um, I don't know. I haven't decided on that. Uh, would you please do a vid on Wazoo? Uh, it's complicated, and I don't know if there's enough demand for the time and effort it takes to do a video on Wazoo, a, a good video. There's plenty of how to install it videos, and that's not what you're asking for. You want it, the tuning video, and that's the harder part of Wazoo. So... Everyone likes it, but when you realize it's it's a lot to get, it's all those easy to install, easy to learn, lifetime to get it right type things. Um, it's one of the reasons I haven't done a video on like Security Onion. The install process is easy. The tuning and setting up and configuring process is where that can get really um, more in depth. I like ButterFS because I'm cheap and like to use whatever drives I have hanging around. ButterFS is not bad. Um, Nothing wrong with that. I think it's a great idea that PFSense moved to ZFS. Uh, can you talk about application traffic shaping in PFSense? Because you because you can shape the application like Sophos and Microtech, uh, but PFSense so hard. Yeah, it's not great. Um, if you have a use case that says, that's what I need, use a firewall that supports it better. Um, cause PF sense isn't that firewall. This is one of those, I start with use case all the time with people and it seems to be lost frequently because they're like, well, wait a minute, you just recommended not to use PF sense. I'm like, uh huh. If it doesn't do something well, like you need web filtering, I say use a different firewall. They're like, but I want to use PF sense. I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't do web filtering. Well, that's where I, that's, you know, you suggest other firewalls. That's the solution to that. Only have a single drive for all my backups. Maybe I'll get to TrueNAS. However, I'd like to go ButterFS, RAID 1.0, storage backups. Yeah, yeah, get more drives when you can. It comes down to budget, of course. I'm using PFSense. My provider it gives me a dynamic IP. It is safe to use a DNS function PFSense traffic PFSense box. Uh, I don't understand the question. Bruh, do you even shout, Seth? I don't, you know, this is one thing people ask a lot, and I, it's these type of, uh, I'm, no, you're being silly here, I hope. Um, but this comes up quite a bit. And I'm working, I'm going to be doing a video with the team over at 45 Drives. And we're going to talk about why not to use Ceph is at least part of the conversation because some people overcomplicate things. It's not like you need Ceph for every situation. Um, it seems to be once people learn something new, they want to add an extra layer of complexity to their networks. You always build your structures, whether those are networking, storage, and everything in between, and all the intersections of those things, you build them only as complicated as they need to be and no more. Adding more layers of complexity has to be justified for a benefit it may have. So not everything needs to be done with Ceph. Not everything needs to be done with a clustered storage solution. It's not always the right solution or even the right budget for clients. If you're just setting things up in a lab, it's fun to play with, it's fun to learn. When you're dealing with the real world, you try to build things as simplistic as possible because you have to support them over the long term. That's a really important thing uh, to think about when you're doing these. I found a dilemma when selling TrueNAS on Gen 8 microserver because I have a P222 with RAID 5 and 4 SAS drives. TrueNAS and ZFS require several single drives. Yes, you need, uh, it needs to talk directly to the drives. Uh, my solution is get something that talks directly to the drives. There's not, I don't know what the workaround would be for that. <laughs> we have to use Cisco. Why? We don't know. We just use Cisco. Yeah, that happens a lot. 
you stuff if you need stuff and uh, or like me plan on being certified and stuff yeah i mean we deploy a backup box to a client site pulls uh backups from nas no ssh can say can we run these on zero to network support staff cannot access resource from lockdown laptops I, i'm not completely under sure the question you're asking but you could set up zero tier on these things um it's a popular way to get data moving it was a bit of a joke but that was a very good answer not everything needs stuff level complexity yeah it's all it is i mean great if you work at a job that does it but that's you know Hmm. So hopefully that makes sense. And uh, sometimes things don't make sense. So we just do that. There we go. All right. Uh, <laughs> nobody gets fired for buying Cisco. That's why people buy Cisco. And that's not true at all. Man, that is, uh, that is definitely not how things are in 2022. <laughs> Okay, not a question, but it's what you do. Yeah, this is, um, I mentioned this when me and Jay did the podcast yesterday, the the Home Lab show. It's also a video you can find. Um, and yesterday's video was about zero tier. Zero tier is a good way to use it as a transport layer for, you know, moving your backups around. Um, it's, it, whatever you do to get your backups in more than one place is good. That's, <laughs> um, that is the big part. Oh, look, it's my son. He has joined the live stream. <laughs> Greetings, son. He's upstairs playing video games. You know, I, I think it's silly. The uh, For those of you who didn't know, there's the Krebs on security. And it's a, it's a sticky situation. I, I briefly read through the docket. And I, I'm not going to do a, I just don't see a reason for me to do a video on it. I'm not a lawyer and I don't pretend to be one on YouTube. Lots of people though online like to pretend to uh, have more legal knowledge than they do. But there's a couple of things that at least from a United States standpoint um, and the way the laws work is interesting. They also made sure they filed in a, in a jurisdiction that would be more favorable to ubiquity because it's, a, it's kind of like a slander case. And the problem becomes, if Krebs reveals sources that you're not required, by the way, as a journalist, you know, I'm not an expert on this, by the way, I'm not claiming or, you know, hashtag this ain't legal advice. Uh, but if, if you're in journalism, you protect your sources. This is something that is part of the journalistic rules, essentially, that we don't have to reveal sources. Uh, you, you're supposed to verify them. And I mean, Krebs verified undoubtedly that this person worked for Ubiquity. They were just a weird situation because they were also the one extorting ubiquity, as we learned later. So they're kind of mad that Krebs didn't redact it. Um, and so now they're saying, you know, he didn't do he didn't put the best effort forward on redacting and revising uh, knowledge that came out later. I don't know. That's going to be sticky for judges to uh, decide. It's also part of Krebs going journalistic integrity of protecting sources becomes a weird thing because now he would have to admit that exactly was his source. I don't think he said exactly who his source was because Krebs doesn't say the names of sources on there unless there's someone who wants to be known. So it's a weird problem. Like I said, not a lawyer. I don't know how that's going to pan out. Uh, you know what? I do know. There's a bunch of lawyers who are going to make a lot of money. On both sides, because that's how some of these cases pan out. Lawyers, they win. Not necessarily the, the, the sides, but the lawyers. There's a lot of money going to be involved in the lawyers. That's why you mostly avoid them, because it's not one, it's not the winning or the losing side. Both people spend a lot of money on lawyers. <laughs> uh, yeah, ZFS, you're not relying on specific hardware. Ah, Lawrence Law. Yeah, new new side channel, right? I have uh, three here getting ready to swap out some old USGs with UXG pros next week. Hmm. Oh, there. Now my daughter has joined the live stream. Is there an issue with Cisco these days that I'm not aware of? Yes. People who find out about contracts and things like that. Um, I, I have known a few people in the enterprise world that are extremely unhappy with some of the Cisco contracts. Um, 
I, I wish they could be more public about it, but these these are you know large deals. It's just friends I have that work in the industry. Uh, Cisco changing the wording of perpetual licenses that they sold. That was such, me and my friend had the craziest story of him and dealing with enterprise Cisco stuff. Um, there was a, a, a local place we dealt with that Cisco screwed up some licensing on and told, well, somebody told someone something. It was a lot of confusion with the Cisco licensing. And once again, Cisco said, nope, you can't have any of these licenses that we told you you could have. And then lawyers got involved and Cisco backpedaled and gave them the license. There's there's a lot of times when people were, Cisco is um, all about the money. And that's the one thing about them. It, it, matter of fact, that's uh, I've seen a lot of anger. If you look up like uh, Meraki, now this is not something I, I have direct firsthand, but I know enough people have complained about it. So because I'm not a Meraki dealer where Meraki has gone around the supplier and violated partner agreements. So there's plenty of people with plenty of anger at Cisco. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> well, PF Sense have zero tiers of package. If enough people ask for it and someone in the package maintainer submits it to there's a process. You can be an external package maintainer. You submit it to the team at NetGate and they will vet it and allow it to be in a package repository. So I'm not the one maintaining the package, so I don't know. Uh, progress on the business channel? Yeah, probably next week I'll have it done. Greetings from Tunisia. Awesome. What this is a funny. What do you think about unified controller of networking features like OSPF and BGP <laughs> in 2022? You're optimistic. I I would say never. I don't foresee them getting into that market. I just don't see it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they'll prove me wrong. But um, I I just don't see them as the uh, company as a go to company for uh, doing that. Sorry, no. Perpetual, what's that? Yes. Get pricing on which you've chosen to make sense, but Ubiquity thinks they are the Apple of networking and Wi-Fi. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Cisco licensing is a mess. I actually have, I, I have numerous ex-Cisco friends. Like, they used to work there and they left because they hated being some of it. They're they're like, the company just makes bad decisions. There's, there's so much. When you get to know some of the people and who used to work there, and it, there's even the joke that uh, Cisco's where products go to die and get monetized. You know, Cisco makes an acquisition. You can almost, a lot of people will joke, like the product will not get any new features, but it will get new licensing that it will be really hard, really hard to configure and really hard to understand and will only end up costing you money and time sorting out. That's the um, Cisco way. So, Hey, whatever they're making money. And if you're a shareholder, bill them. I mean, if you got, if you're holding stock and you're looking for a profitable company, they're turning a profit. Have you reviewed the, your plan review, the high point MVME rate cards? Um, I have, uh, I took a picture. We were, we were actually playing with a couple things and I'll pull it up real quick. I don't even know who makes this one. I don't know the brand, but you get the idea what this is. Hey, look, it's a raid card with four Western Digital Blacks in there. I don't know. Um, so we were doing some testing with this. It doesn't really like my Dell server that much. That's that's what our testing has really taught us. It doesn't really like the Dell server. Um, it works. It, the bifurcation works. It recognizes the drives that we're not getting the speed we want out of it. Um, we don't know why. And we're trying some other motherboards. So kind of, uh, I plan on building a true NAS MVME system. Um, so they're pretty cool. Uh, let's see. They also make full size PCA carriers that will hold four U2 MVME drives. Yeah. Is that a NetGap makes a thumbnail or just something new with it? Yes, that's the 4100. We've been testing it for a little while. I've just been busy and not finished the review. They were thinking, uh, so I got the box already, and they were like, hey, tell me you have a review done this week. I'm like, I've got a lot of things scheduled. Um, I still do a, a decent amount of consulting myself 
with storage servers. There's been kind of a lot of it. We've got some really big bids and really big companies we're working with right now for designing storage. So I haven't had the time to finish the review on the 4100, but there's no problem with it. It works as expected. We've been using it for testing and all the testing we've done with it has worked perfectly well. So um, I'll have the review done probably by next week, but it's it's a great it's a great product so far. Everyone asked this, how's everyone dealing with network equipment and client demand with all the chip shortages? We have another project we can't do. That's what, that's how we just tell people, um, no, you can't have the thing you want. Here are some substitutions. That's it. Those, those are your options. Uh, yes, even for the servers in my home, I create them a basic possible to maintaining a service range runs 24 seven. Yes, that's probably, you're probably catching up from earlier conversations. Yeah, ordering things months in advance. Yeah, that's part of it too. Uh, LTT is not for everyone, but they've been discussing implementing uh, high-speed NVMe storage and the challenges it has. Yes, they've got a couple of good videos on it. Windows helped them out with it, and they've talked about that almost a year ago. Um because you can build this, you keep building the storage to storage faster, but then you start need to hook up the data feed to it, you know, 100 gig connectivity. And then you go, oh, the software is not quite there with some of the 100 gig activity. So it needs some specific tuning to be done. Uh, mm -hmm. Wendell from level one has talked about this a little bit more in depth. But yeah, that's definitely a, a challenge. Um. I, th I don't know. I'm not the best person to ask you. See, maybe a bit off topic, but what cert do you recommend getting in networking in 2022? CCNA. I don't have any certs myself and I don't look for jobs. So I'm not the best answer for that. Um, I, I don't think it's bad necessarily to get CCNA, but look at what the job postings are looking for. And is that the, is that the qualifier they need? Uh, SAS drive from eBay, buy extra. That's my thoughts on that. I mean, you, it's, it's a, it's a random rolling of the dice. <laughs> uh, you don't know if you're going to get good ones or bad ones. We actually had a, a weird eBay experience. Um, when we, a while ago I bought for a project I needed to put together is actually for a, a server to, for my friend. We ordered them. They sent us the wrong drives. So I complained on eBay and they sent us another set of drives, but they were the wrong drives again, but they were bigger drives than the original ones that they said they were going to send in the ad. And I said that you sent us the wrong ones. And they said, we'll send them all back and we'll send more. And I said, well, no, you got to pay the shipping to get these back. Just send me the right drives. And then never heard back from them again. And I'm like, well, whatever we have drives. We, I mean, I was being honest and letting them know they sent me the wrong ones. They were only slightly bigger, but whatever, we got bigger drives out of it. So sometimes you don't always know what people. Hello from Scotland, beer and chips on you. Uh, you know, um, what you call chips, we call fries. I think that's interesting. So, These comments, I'm just going to call you out on this. This is not a... I canceled a big order because ubiquity suing Krebs. Uh, please tell me you use no Microsoft at all ever in your life, because at any given moment, Microsoft has so many silly lawsuits going on. Um, I, I mean, yeah, sure. I'll complain about it, but oh yeah, let's boycott ubiquity, uh, and, and go spend twice as much money somewhere or eight times as much with Cisco. Uh, because you know, it's not like Cisco's never had a silly lawsuit or anything like that. I don't know. You complain about it. You vote with your stock price because that's actually what they're mad about is their stock evaluation price change. So I don't know. I, it just seems like, oh, canceling orders for it. I'm not. I'm throwing it out there. I, I I will call it out and say it's stupid. I don't understand it completely, that whole lawsuit with Krebs, but I'm not running around canceling orders. All the ubiquity orders we have in place are still going because it's the right product for the solution we're trying to provide. Simple as that. Certs can be good to get your foot in the door. Otherwise, you probably don't need them unless you're working for a value-added reseller. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. And what we call chips, they call Chris. Yes. North Wales. Awesome. I won't be canceling anything. Ubiquity works well. You know what, Matt? Cody's got the best answer right here. Please cancel all of your stuff because we're having shortage problems. So all of you angry at Ubiquity, cancel all your orders right now. Show your anger because I really need a lot of stuff that's out of stock. <laughs> I think this is, you I mean, let me get everyone rolling. Everyone, please cancel orders. I need a few more devices and I can only get five of something I needed. So <laughs> there we go. I think Cody's got the best idea yet. <laughs> Ah, fun times. What else do we have in here? So the, uh, I see more people seem to like this. I'm telling you, man, it, Cody, you, you're on to something. Please cancel it. <laughs> this is, <laughs> you're in the same boat I am. We, we have, um, just lots of stuff's up in the air. We're, you know, we're doing substitutions is the answer uh, because if the customer has to get something done and they can't get that part or they had their heart set on a specific thing, yes, we the only solution at that point is substitution. So oh, the chip shortage is really a fries shortage. Yeah, we don't have enough potatoes, so... We need we need more potatoes to make more French fries or uh, chips, as some places may call them. Yeah, yeah, so confusing. There we go. Same thing. Cancel as much as you can. We need more stuff in stock. This is you know, and I turned down a job today. Someone. I mean, it, it's it's not that we don't want to turn it down. It's just one of those things. It's going to be expensive to set this up. Someone wanted to set up a unified dream machine, but because um, they wanted to modify the JSON file, get the wire guard working, and because tie it to another PF Sense and everything else. And I'm like, why don't you just use PF Sense and solve the problem and do wire guard south to south, uh, site to site? So, <laughs> Brett Chittum, hello from Southgate, Michigan. <laughs> Yeah. It's very difficult to get any wireless equipment, even more so outside the U.S. Uh, if they cancel all the orders, maybe my freight forwarder. Yeah. That is a, um, it is a tough situation right now when it comes to that, man. It's, I don't know. The uh, We'll slowly, one thing is going to happen. It'll, I don't know. It'll, it'll catch up eventually. It just takes time. Um. Oh, it's getting cold here. I'll press press magic button, warm up car. So let's see. Oh, I got to figure out how to charge my car is because I got some driving to do. I do have a hard stop. Uh, I, uh, in like 10 minutes, I have a hard stop because I'm supposed to go somewhere. So that's a, that's a thing. My car is almost charged anyways. I didn't have it plugged in this morning because... Uh, Oh, where'd it go? I like the little animation. <laughs> so 25 minutes remaining. It's It's got charge enough to where I need to go. But the uh, I uh, we had a really bad windstorm this morning and the power is flickering. And I whenever the power is flickering, I think maybe I shouldn't plug my Tesla in in case there's a big power surge. I don't know. <laughs> so I have, oh, people ask where I'm going. I have a board meeting. Uh, I belong to different uh, groups, so sometimes you'll see that I go to board meetings, and uh, I am on an advisory. I have an advisory position for an educational institute. Um, I won't give all. I don't know. I don't want to talk about all the details of it, but essentially, yes, I do stuff like that. Off topic: Do you see YouTube as a business opportunity or just a way to share knowledge uh, with your interests? Has that changed since you started? Um, no, I like sharing knowledge. I've been doing public speaking for years in a long time. I've been doing, um, it's, I'm not new to the 
going to Linux conferences or whatever and speaking. Uh, YouTube is an extension of that. And it, um, I mean, we still use it because I can't, I have to make money. So we advertise my services on YouTube channel. Yeah. But uh, that's also because I hired, like Brett, I hired last year so I could spend more time creating videos. So as I spend more time creating videos, uh, got to have some way to get paid. I still own the business, but the, you know, you kind of have a circle of life here. So I still give away a lot of knowledge, but I also, um, the advantage I have, if you may notice this for me as a YouTube content creator, is I'm not driven by selling whatever ad sells the most because I'm self-sponsoring most things. And I'm not driven by just getting the most views all the time to get the most ad sponsors. Uh, I still talk about the things I want to talk about. Uh, if, if you are a YouTuber full time, the only focus you have if your goal is to make money at YouTube is to do the things and optimize YouTube to make the most money, which means reaching the broadest audiences and going less in depth. Uh, I will not get the views uh, that you would get if someone um, going in depth just doesn't get as many views because it's niche content. Uh, being broad topic means you're going to get more views on those videos. So that's a lot of it. <laughs> bored or bored? I choose to be on these committees uh, of when I'm on a foundation. So I'm not bored at all. I'm helping advise to help uh, bring forward education. It's a volunteer position um, I do. I volunteered to be on charity boards and uh, nonprofits be, uh, before. This is something I've been doing for a long, long before YouTube. Um, doing things like that is just another way I give back to the community. If, if you, I don't know, the more you kind of know some of the things I do, I'm not just a YouTube give back to the community. I do public events or participate in charity and nonprofit boards um, where I just have advisory roles to help. Uh, get charities going or help education institute. This is a nonprofit education institute um, and make sure things are the way they need to be. So <laughs> hopefully that makes sense. Pizza. Uh, there's a pizza in the, I, I don't, I have to drive somewhere, Marcus, my son. <laughs> so I have to uh, tell you to go get the pizza out of the freezer. YouTube is the primary advertising for my business now. Yeah, um, well, we still go out there. Uh, matter of fact, Brett just got back. He went on site uh, somewhere. We still do in person. Uh, we still go to Chamber of Commerce events. We still do all the things we used to do. So YouTube is um, the primary income or primary leads. I say not income, primary lead generation, but we also uh, still do all the other things that we need to do going to events. Uh, let's see. I did a video yesterday on the UXG Pro. Wife is an educator. Great, you do what you do. Ah, uh, yes. The education institutes sometimes need help. They, they, they want. They, <laughs> sometimes they wanted me to be an instructor, and I was like, no, I, I will advise and help, but I don't have time to be an instructor. <laughs> Um, my son schools remotely. He schools online. Yes, my son is researching pizza consumption for sure. Uh, besides PSN, what are firewalls you guys use? Test. I'm looking to go away uh, from Rocky, possibly going for 40 net or PFSN. Um, Untangle is the other big one out there that we like. Untangle makes a really solid product. And Untangle is the answer for people who go, hey, I need application filtering or uh, or specifically web filtering. Uh, that's a feature of Untangle. It's sold as a subscription. And if you say the word subscription, the majority of the PF Sense people go, no, not a subscription. I need free, but I need all those really fancy features and those feeds that uh, Untangle has that allow for those fancy features to work. And those come at a price. Um, so my problem with Fortinet is they have a horrible track record in the past with security of hard coding credentials. Look up the magic packet with their VPNs with the back door they put in from bad coding practices of Oops, we put a backdoor on the VPN. Like I, their history of bad coding. Now they haven't had an incident lately, which is good. But that's my problem I've had with Fortinet. Um, we've also, from dealing with their um, 
the, what do you call it? Dealing with some of the problems like with their support people were aggravating. Uh, we had some IPsec problems. Turn out we, we found a flaw in their IPsec. Uh, and then they wanted to charge the client for the firmware update. And I, it was stupid. Um, we've only had a couple interactions with their support people from when we had to integrate with them. I wasn't blown away by them. Now, where they are aggressive is their reseller programs are aggressive for people to make money with them. So uh, that seems to push a lot of people towards them more so than the quality of their product, I feel. Uh, my friend used to admin a lot of checkpoint firewalls for a really big medical conglomerate. Uh, he liked them. I, I, I never used them. He said they were fine. Does Untangle use Open App ID? They have their own. I have a video on Untangle. Watch it or go to their website and read up on Untangle. They they cover. They're like the other firewall companies. They don't give you all the nuts and bolts on the back end. They have a, a, a good system. They'll tell you we have application filtering. We have filtering. They you can dig in. It's an open source firewall. You can dig into what the back end is. It's just not. It's not like PF Sense where it's all implicitly telling you what the back end is. Because you have threat management and untangle, and on PF Sense you can load Snort or Sericata and fine tune the rules. You can still fine tune the rules and untangle, but it's not like they're calling it the same thing. They're not. They're not exposing the same level of detail you might get with something like PF Sense. Um, it, but it's still a good system. There's a reason we like untangles. Uh, have you preferred site to site from IPsec to WireGuard, or do you have a preference? Um, slowly removing the WireGuard, but not all the time. Um, so it's getting there. Uh, just if, if I'm gonna do something new, it's, it's going to be probably there, but for the most part, if it's all set up and configured, I'm probably not going to swap it because there's not there, unless there's some reason or push to doing it, uh, we won't. So Uh, nope. Haven't really deployed any of protect LEs. We don't really get a lot of those. Um, not in years. Like we did like on 2016, um, lately so far, as long as we can find the net gates in stock and we just been putting in higher end net gates, we, th there's one of those substitution supply chain problems. Uh, the higher end ones were more available than the lower end ones. So the option when you're finishing a project was just to put the higher end net gate device in, um, whatever, that's just part of it. So hopefully that makes sense. What do you think of Pi Hole? Uh, I would never consider Pi Hole an enterprise web filter at all. It's a project, but not a not a web filter. So, all right, I will say five more minutes, and then there's my uh, stop. So five more minutes of questions, and uh, we'll go from there because I got to go do what I got to go do. Um, let's see. Smash the like button. That's what we should do. Go over here. We got 173 concurrent viewers, but 59 likes. Let's go ahead and uh, we'll watch that number go up. There, I can put myself on this one too. I, I got to look at this camera. Uh, let's see. Five minutes time is 15 minutes time. Yeah, not this time because I actually have to physically be somewhere. I am actually, a, if, if it's something business related, I am on time. I'm rather prompt. So I will um, I will be going to where I need to be. I got to read. I have an agenda I have to read and, you know, notes and then forms. And that is the one part that I never look forward to doing these types of things is uh, having to fill out paperwork. But I know they, they are aware of my, um, <laughs> how I feel like it. No update yet. Next week, I should have the business channel done. I keep saying next week. I need to hire someone for this. Um, I just don't know who to hire. So this is something that I, I need someone to just do social media stuff and like put graphics on channels and uh, update shirt stores and things like that. I'm, I need to hire someone to do that. That's something, you know, I don't know if I, great if they're local. Maybe I can consider a remote position for that. That is definitely on my to-do list. That way it's not me doing it. That's um, uh, definitely one of the challenges. Uh, let's see. 
Can't you just push them to digital instead of paperwork? I mean, it's, I say paperwork. I, I don't mean physical right on paper. I, I do mean fill out a form. I refer to it as paperwork because I'm old, uh, but you're right. It is all just a, it, it's just going to be me putting stuff into a um, form. Uh, hoping to get some micro tick here. <laughs> Taking writing drive images. I don't really do drive images. I've talked about doing um, using uh, Clonezilla. Clonezilla is good for that. So if you're looking for drive imaging, but I don't, it's not something I really ever do. Can you ask vendors to sponsor a giveaway? I don't really have anyone who does certifications is in my sponsors list to do that. So. You're running in Checkpoint ArcSense at home looking to move PFSense due to some features they don't have. Does PFSense have a manager for multiple firewalls? Nope, each firewall is on its own. And sometimes I miss questions. Uh, so I see you said this isn't a technical q and It is. Um, I, I Most of these are pretty technical. I'm answering a lot of technical questions. But nonetheless, uh, a more in-depth, as I put it all the time, a more in-depth discussion is over in my forums because there's only so many questions and answers and people looking for something more articulate to, for me to talk to. The forums is where I answer things there. Although I, I try not to leave anything unanswered in the forums, but some questions are so off the wall, I'm not sure what to respond with. I've seen a couple of them. Like People will ask me, about something unrelated I've never talked to. And I'm like, I, I just don't have an answer for this. And I'm always wondering if I should answer, like I've never used these products before, so I don't know. And I'm trying to do that more. So people know it's not like, you know, you ask something that's off topic that even the other forum members may not respond. Um, and there's a lot of people in my forum. I think, you know, a few thousand people that visit there. Um, I think you get like 5,000 hits a day and there's about a thousand active users logged in any given day. And I think there's 2000 plus users, but either way, um, there's a lot of response in there, but sometimes people ask questions and it's because there's not really an answer to the question. Um, or, or people who do the, um, you know, overly long questions that it's harder to answer as well. So hopefully that all makes sense. Uh, but I'm going to wind it off here. Um, I don't have an answer for this one either. I need to find a new hot sauce from ReSharp's Habanero, a little too sweet. Uh, which Linux system are we using? Pop OS. And a new version should be out soon. Pop OS is awesome. So, hey, thank you very much. Have a pleasant board meeting and safe journey. Yes, much appreciated. So thank you, everyone who joined. I will have that video done soon that I was talking about the backups and... Uh, all kinds of more fun videos coming soon. So uh, yeah, let me know. And as always, if you're looking for a more in-depth discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com. Let me just throw that on there. I mean, this is, I also, you know, hit, you can say hi on Twitter, but I don't do tech support on Twitter. Um, but forums right here. There's a reason I, I take the time to maintain and curate all of this is so people have a place to discuss things. It's uh, I, I get it. There's YouTube is not always easy and they don't let you post links and things like that. That's why I run the forums. So nonetheless, that's my little rant on that. Thank you everyone and take care.